Hello, and welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast, where it is my job to discuss democratic institutions. In today's episode, I discuss power sharing democratic institutions in Switzerland with my guest, Jean Müller. Power sharing is a crucial element of the success of Swiss consensus democracy. Yet it was a long and troublesome process that started with lots of social cleavages. Not only had two conflicting religious groups, the Catholics and the Protestants, to be integrated into democratic agreements, also four languages are spoken in the different regions, and 26 cantons have different cultures, traditions, and each wants to have a say. Switzerland, thus, was an unlikely case to become a consociational democracy. Shaw Müller and I discuss milestones in the development of the Swiss constitution and its democratic institutions. Important power-sharing institutional pillars are federalism, a proportional representation electoral system, a federal council as executive government, and direct democracy. Dr. Jean Müller is an assistant professor at the University of Lausanne, specialized in Swiss and comparative federalism, territorial politics and direct democracy. Our discussion is based on a recently revised edition of the book Swiss Democracy, Possible Solutions to Conflict in Multicultural Societies, written by Wolf Linder and Jean Müller. I can highly recommend the book to better understand Swiss institutional development and possible implications for other multicultural societies. You can find more information on Sean Müller's projects and work on his website, and he is also an active member on Twitter. And I link to both in the show notes. I am your host, Stefan Kaibertz, and this is the sixth episode in my podcast, the rules of the game, where I discuss, analyze and compare democratic institutions from around the world. I am a political economist with a PhD in economics from the University of Bern in Switzerland, and I previously held positions at the London School of Economics and Political Science and the Center for Global Development. Please subscribe to this podcast on any podcast platform and you'll always get the latest episode. A great way to support my work is to leave a review on your preferred platform. You can find me on Twitter at Skybirds and you can find show notes with links to all material discussed on my website rulesofthegame.blog. Now please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Sean Müller. Sean Müller Welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast. Uh, very happy to have you. Thank you for the invitation. So as usually, I want to give the audience a, a brief introduction of your background and of your kind of personal relationship to democracy. So what is your first memory of democracy? Well, in Switzerland, people have to be from somewhere. Somebody once said, it doesn't matter who you are, you have to be from somewhere. I'm from Canton of Glarus. And those of you who uh, listen regularly to the podcast know that we still have the Landsgemeinde. So obviously one of my first memories uh, that I actually remember myself has to do with the Landsgemeinde, the, the assembly of citizens in free air that meets once a year to decide uh, collective decisions. So as a kid, I was allowed to sit in front and just listen to the debates. And then when I turned 18, I was lucky to be born in March. So when May came, uh, I was just fresh into my uh, voting rights and I was able to participate. And I remember until this day that we had a very lively discussion going on. Me and my friends, we were standing there. Um, but because the Landsgemeinde is also a kind of a party um, where you drink a lot, our main worry was to then run to the toilet. And this dem democratic debate just dragged on forever and ever. And we had to uh, decide what was more important, our personal health or the collective good. So we stayed until the end. <laughs> that's cool. That's that's a very fun story uh, connected to democracy. And interestingly, also a former a, a guest previously, uh, Pascal Wishar, he had uh, a similar kind of first experience of democracy uh, with the Landsgemeinde, the Cantonal Assembly that I discussed in another in another episode. 
Cool. And uh, when did you develop that interest for democratic questions? Like you are very involved in research. You're you're um, doing academic research at at the University of Lausanne. And and how far does that go back to in in your in your life? Um, well, as I said, obviously the, the personal connection played a role, but I don't think I would have uh, really gone on to study political science had I not had some kind of personal connections with the University of Fribourg that led me to attend an open day. And then I actually sat in a class on philosophy um, and, and it was just too abstract for me what, what they were speaking in philosophy. And then I spoke to a friend who was doing political sociology or a friend of a friend it was even more abstract, very, very uh, structural and, and, and vague. And then by chance, I discovered this class on political science and I just immediately liked it. And sometimes in life, you just know that something suits you and, and uh, speaks to something inside you and you can't really pin it down. And ever since this, this whole question of, I mean, you named your podcast after the rules of the game, this whole question of how do these rules come about, who decides on them, who decides, who can decide the intricacies of the power dynamics of the actors, um, differences between different uh, societies. I find this a, a very fascinating topic. And, and uh, so far, my interest has not waned. On the contrary, the more I discover, the more I learn that, that there is so much more yet to, to discover on, on how we actually take the decisions that, that we do and, or, or that we should take for all of us. I think, especially in Switzerland, this, this proximity to um, democratic decision making at, at the various um, government levels, but also through direct democracy, just um, creates, I think, for most people, this strong connection with democracy. And this is also what we want to talk about today. Um, the Some of the Swiss institutions that uh, helped build that society in Switzerland, which is in the beginning was or is very multicultural in, in many uh, dimensions, but somehow the, the country realized or achieved to make, create this consensus democracy. And that depends on a lot of uh, specific institutions, but also developments over time. And this is really what we want to talk about today. And maybe uh, let's start with Switzerland kind of 150 or 200 years ago, what it looked like and what made it actually an unlikely case in, in some respects to become a, a consensus or a consultational uh, democracy. So what are some of the characteristics uh, of, of Switzerland? So if we go 200, in year, 200 years back in time, I mean, we arrive right after the, the French Revolution and sort of the birth of this notion of, of nationhood that uh, all those who live within a fixed territory have certain things in common or they should have certain things in common. There should be solidarity on a grand scale, also with people that we don't know, uh, that we don't meet on a regular basis, that live far away. But because we live the same territory, we should want the same things and we are identical in the same thing. And if you looked at Switzerland, this would have been the least likely place to ever see this sense of nationhood uh, emerge because there were four different language groups. There were different cantons with different economic traditions, with different structures. So you had the city cantons, cities of Zurich, of Basel, of Geneva. Um, you had the rural communities where people basically just lived on subsistence economy and you had a few a feudal elites that uh, made a lot of money with sending the poor Swiss who could not afford uh, food into the army. So mercenaries uh, were a big thing. So you had all those different, uh, and we haven't even talked about uh, religion. So religion, it's hard to realize today that religion was actually the most divisive factor uh, not just in Europe, but especially in Switzerland, we had four civil wars dealing with uh, dealing with religion, um, so different beliefs of what is the right way to live and so on and so forth. So all these differences, they were all present. So we didn't just have several languages, we didn't just have several religions, we didn't just have different uh, economic and historical traditions. We had all of that, plus we had big nation-state projects going on around all, uh, the whole country. So you had Germany in the north, France in the west, Italy in the South. So in a way, if you had to bet your money on something, um, you would not have betted on, on Switzerland becoming an independent, multinational or at least plurilingual country. 
you'd have just predicted that it would be absorbed, partitioned and absorbed into the respective bigger, more powerful nation states. Instead, the exact opposite has happened. Yeah, exactly. And so we can really summarize as Switzerland being a, a multicultural country with two strong uh, religious um, groups, the Catholics and the Protestants, uh, that came out from the Reformation period in the 16th century. And then we have the four different languages, German, uh, French, Italian, and Romanche, that really made it an unlikely case to become a consensus democracy. And so briefly, let's go through some of the stages uh, of constitutional development that were, uh, were important. Uh, and... Mainly, I would say we could also summarize that the country went from a system that was more majoritarian and in some sense winner take all and became more of a, um, a integrated multi-party democracy. So uh, the first point was, or an important um, point in time was obviously the, the writing of the modern constitution of Switzerland in, in 1848. And then... Tell us a bit about uh, some of the milestones in, in the development in the, in the decades that, that followed. It's hard to decide where to start because where we, where we start decides how we tell the story in a way. Um, my former supervisor once told me history is too important to be left to the historians. It should be the political science job to explain history. So let's do justice to the historians and start in the very beginning. I mean, in the Middle Ages, there was a series of treaties signed between these different communities, rural, urban, Catholic, Protestant, mountain, valley, outside, inside, oriented. So over 500 years, you had a tradition of, of treaty making. So when it came to, now we may take a big jump to 1848, when it came to 1848, this pattern of first sitting together around the table and deciding on a document was already well established. It was already uh, a practice that had been done by the fathers and the forefathers and the four forefathers, not the mothers yet at that time. Um, so there was a precedent. And at the same time, there was enough commonality among those different groups um, that, that led to a sort of uh, common denom denominator as to what modern Switzerland should look like back in, in 1848. Because even those who were in favor of a more centralized state, they did not want to abolish the cantons. Um, even those who wanted to have a unified economic system, they had no interest in imposing a, uni a single language. There was no interest in imposing a single language regime because all you wanted to do was make money for the winners of the Civil War in 1847. So they could all agree on a compromise. Obviously, some were more happy than others, but the basic compromise is, was that we create a new state, a new level above the canton level, but it's a very minimal level. Um, only very few powers were delegated to that new level. It was one of the most decentralized or non-centralized regime uh, at that time, modeled after the U.S., in some way after the U.S. experience that, that predated it by some decades. And at the same time, the cantons were given a number of veto powers, and especially the losers of the civil war, so the Catholic, uh, rural, uh, German, but also some French-speaking parts, were given enough uh, structural um, uh, abilities that if they really wanted to impede the future change, they could do it. So it was not just a, a blanket check that was created by the winners of the civil war for themselves, for the future, but they were already cognizant that in order to create a sustainable regime, they needed to bring on board everybody and not just a simple majority. And at the same time, they created institutions that facilitated the dialogue between the different groups. So rather than just separating, you go your way, we go our way, I don't think they had the intention or they were thinking in terms of political science theories, centripetalism to create common institutions. But there was a two-chamber parliament created, which somehow forced even the elite of the losing side, of the antagonists of centralization, to come to what was then the capital burn and speak to the winners. And this sort of helped create and forge a common entity, at least among the elite, because in a way they were all in the same boat. They all were elected and wanted to be re-elected. Um, so why not join forces and help each other out in terms of creating a common good for everybody? So that was 1848. 
um, <clears throat> obviously it was just a man. It was just a man that had a certain revenue that were married and, and uh, didn't commit any crime that were allowed to participate in all uh, those affairs political. And then with the industrialization, there was sort of a first new player, new kid on the block, um, workers, and then the Socialist Party. Socialist Party was actually the first party created as a party at the national level in Switzerland, because the winners of the civil war, they didn't need to organize themselves as a party. They had already won. They were already there. They were already in all the powers uh, that matter. So all the seven ministers, they were from that party, which was not really a party. It was just like a common, a boys club, we would call it today, Manchester liberalism or other sorts of, of liberalism. So the socialists were the first uh, force to really rock the boat um, in the 1860s, 70s. And, uh, but even the socialists, they were not strong enough to really rock the boat fully because of Switzerland's decentralized nature. Um, there was never really one dominant city like France or London that created a, a mass proletariat around or, or within uh, the city limits that, that helped mobilize socialist or communist forces. Everything is always decentralized in Switzerland, in the different cities where, where industrialization took off, or even in the rural communities where industrialization took off. So that was a disadvantage for the socialists, but it was an advantage for Swiss politics because being strong but not strong enough forced the socialists to join forces with the other excluded force of, of the new state, the Catholic conservatives. So it's like the devil and the angel shaking hands. I leave it up to you to decide who's the devil and who's the angel. But these two sides joined forces because they were both excluded by the liberal elite and although pursuing completely different interests, Catholic conservatism and, and at that time still the social revolutionary ideas, they joined forces in pushing for a greater openness of the system. So they brought the uh, popular initiative on partial constitutional change onto the agenda and, uh, and had it passed. They brought also proportional elections for the National Council, Onto the agenda. That was something demanded by the two main opposition forces against the liberal elite. And so it's actually only since 1891 that we see the direct democratic element uh, play a bigger role, together with 1874 when we have the facultative referendum. So end of the 19th century, we have the two main instruments of direct democracy. In 1919, first elections for the National Council according to the proportional elections where the space, the political space is opened up also for other forces and not just the liberal elite which through gerrymandering, through other tricks of the trade managed to hold on to power although being a minority. And it's actually only in, since the beginning of the 20th century that Switzerland is really entering the path of, of power sharing at least in that dimension. Obviously it was always federal so the vertical division of power was always there and has, in a sense, weakened uh, over time, whereas the horizontal division of power between the government and, and the parties and the two chambers of parliament has gained in importance um, to the extent that today um, we have a debate whether seven ministers in government is enough to accommodate all the political forces that, that have sprung up and that play a role for the different segments of society. Mm, right. Thanks a lot for this uh, overview. That's 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 very interesting. And just to recap quickly, to to uh, kind of emphasize again these these important elements. So, kind of direct democracy was important in shaping these institutions. So, um, the popular initiative for a full revision of the constitution was actually already included in the in the constitution 1848. And then in, in seven, uh, 1874, um, the, the revision or the referendum was included. And finally, in, in 1891, the, um, the popular initiative for the partial revision of the constitution was included. And that helped to essentially reshape other institutions like the electoral law, right? So that is really an important step only the partial revision of the constitution uh, through a popular initiative allowed essentially to introduce proportional representation. And proportional representation became really an important element of, 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 of Swiss 
democratic institutions at all levels, not only at the, the national level, but also at the, at the lower levels of government. And so now it, I think it's, it would be good to give some um, further insights into the power sharing uh, institutions. So obviously power sharing uh, can be described in a, in a more general sense that, um, you know, power shared is shared among different uh, regions, uh, among different uh, parties, so the multi-party system, but also in a, in a federal level. This in contrast to a winner-take-all politics or a winner-take-all system where usually one party has, uh, has a strong majority and uh, like we see, for example, in the, in the United Kingdom. Now, the power-sharing institutions, they were developed over time, as I said. For example, the proportional representation was included in, at all levels and why was proportional representation so so important in in the development of the consensus democracy? I think we need to look at things and and backwards. So <clears throat> when we are confronted with the law as it is today, we want to know how this law came about. So who makes the laws? Now the laws are typically made by by parliaments. Of course, they have their advisors, there is the bureaucracy, there are interest groups that try to influence parliamentarians, that try to place their parliamentarians in the key positions where they can actually write the law the way they want it. But it comes down to parliament. Parliament is tasked with making the law, it's legislative. So how do we know who enters parliament? Well, that's the electoral system. The electoral system decides how the votes are translated into seats. So it's eminently important to know the rules of the game, of the electoral game. How can we change it? How can we change the rules of a game where those who profit from the game decide on the, on the rules? So the partial initiative, the initiative on partial constitutional change, um, it took three attempts by the Catholic conservatives and the socialists. Um, only at the third try did the majority of citizens and, and cantons accept this initiative so that uh, the National Council had to be elected using proportionality, henceforth. What I want to say with that is that nothing is a given, nothing is automatic. Actors had to fight to get a share of political power. And, and uh, in a way, it's a kind of a functional story. Once you start opening up the political space to one group, you allow that group to, uh, to thrive and to find other allies, and they join forces and they get a little bit more of the political cake. And then other groups also want to have a bit of the cake. So they also join forces and there's even more. So the situation we have today can really only be explained by looking at the whole evolution of, of power sharing. In, in fact, today it's hard to find an institution where power is not shared. Even the Swiss people, you would think that, okay, Switzerland has direct democracy. So once the people decide, that's really the institution we turn to. But guess what? When you want to change the constitution, you need a majority of the people and of the cantons. And how each canton votes is decided by the people in that canton. So it's perfectly possible, and it happens, in fact, more and more, that you have conflicting majorities of the same people, just because you count them differently, uh, how they are distributed territorially. So even the people have to share power with themselves. So there's no institution where there is no power sharing. Now, which institution you want to look at first depends whether you're an elitist or, or a populist. We can start with the people and discuss the differences within the people and the parties and the regions and the languages. Or we can start with the government and look at how the government operates with seven members that formally at least all have the same amount of power. And yet they are elected based on a, on a party ticket, which means somehow they have to cater to the party interest. But at the same time, they have to share their party interests with other powers. And that is really a, a, a speciality, I would say, of, of Switzerland in that sense that the government is consisting of seven members and is a, um, a body, a council that um, together decides on, on, on government issues. Now, that depended a lot on, on, on proportional representation as well, or, or it kind of... Um, only proportional representation allowed for a better representation in government because the parliament is electing uh, the federal council. So the federal council 
is an institution which is quite unique uh, for Switzerland, but it's, it's a very strong uh, power sharing institution. Why do you think that not more other countries use that type of, of institution? Do we, do we know that or, or is there a reason or is it just that just other institutions were, were more, I don't know, present internationally and were adopted more often? It's a good question. I don't think anyone has the answer to why not more countries adopt the, the Swiss system of having seven, or it could be nine, it could be five, it could be 11, equally powerful ministers elected by parliament, but once they're elected, they're not accountable to parliament during the whole term of their of their mandate, nor can they dissolve uh, parliament. So it's a peculiar mix of presidential parliamentary system, plus there are seven and not just one. Um, Obviously, past dependencies play a big role. Um, several countries chose a system and then stuck with it because it somehow always worked for them. So why change a winning team? In Switzerland, seven was kind of the agreed upon number back in 1848. Um, in allusion to the directorate, the French directorate that had five, it was a big enough number to give everybody a little bit. So already, even though there was just one party in, in the quotation marks in power in 1848, the members of the government represented different areas. So they were from different cantons. For instance, Canton of Bern and Canton of Zurich have almost always had a representative in the federal government since 1848. Um, at the same time, there was always at least two Catholics. Obviously, these were Catholics with a liberal inclination and not a conservative inclination, but Catholics nonetheless. Um, it could have been perfectly possible to occupy the seven seats already back in 1848 with seven hardcore liberals uh, from the seven winners of, of the Civil War. But instead it was chosen, it was a liberal choice to give the minority also at least some share of the power. I suspect it was a, a self-interested choice in order that decisions are applied and adhered to um, better to include and broaden the alliance to, to ease the, the application. Other countries have chosen different paths. Doesn't mean that other paths are wrong. Doesn't mean that this is the only path and, and our path or the Swiss path has some disadvantages as well. So no system is perfect. So you have seven, they need to agree. What if they can't agree? Or what if they don't abide by a lot of the informal, a lot of, a lot of Swiss politics is, is decided or regulated by informal rules. So, for instance, the, the council can very well decide with the majority vote within, but towards the outside, it is expected that each member defends the decision once taken by the council, even if you personally and even if your party strongly opposes that decision. So, depending on who you are, which party you're from, it forces you almost into a schizophrenic role because you have to wear two hats or you have to leave your party hat from before you entered government aside and adopt the new hat. You're now a member of the council. And that can be looked at as a disadvantage because how do we know who takes decisions if it's all of them, if it's the council without a face or seven faces, who do we blame if things go wrong? It's easier to have one person and replace her or him than replace all seven much more revolutionary and Switzerland is not the country for revolutions it's much more evolutionary yeah exactly and also obviously our accountability is is a big a, a big issue like in the US system where for example where you have a president it's clearly who is accountable right and with a with a, a body that are is consisting of seven members and they are elected by parliament accountability is obviously an issue and there were um tries to uh, actually have the federal council elected by the people, but that proposal was, was rejected. Interestingly, also, these power-sharing um, executive councils, they are used also at the cantonal level. So it's, there's different versions, different sizes. Some are elected um, by the people as well. So there's really the, the element of, of uh, federalism that now uh, comes in where we, we see this experimentation of um, different versions of the same institutions at the subnational level. And I think that's also an important element of the Swiss democracy because a lot of the institutions, like, for example, proportional representation, have been tried before at the subnational level and have 
and different cantons have experimented with them. And then finally, there was kind of a, uh, a consensus at the end which institution might be the, the most suitable at the, at the national level. The federalism is, is an important element as well, and that was crucial, I would say, to balance power between the, the central and the subnational level, but also to um, integrate all the various cantons in, the, in, in one kind of central government institution so that all the regions, all the, the, the languages, but also the religions were, were balanced. And so I'd like to discuss federalism a little bit more in detail what do you think are, are the most important elements of, of, of Swiss uh, federalism and, and how, how did they help to uh, include the religions and, and the languages? I think if, if we speak about Swiss federalism, we have to realize that it's, it's a bottom-up affair. So the question is not, as it is in other countries, such as Belgium or India or even Germany, how much power do we decentralize to the local level? But the question in Switzerland has always been, how much power do we centralize? Because those who held power initially, and in some domains still hold power to a very uh, large extent, are the cantons. So that the point of departure was, was already a, a non-centralized state of affairs, where you had 25 or 26 um, members of the family, and at least a large majority of them had to agree to now delegate something to the head of the family. Or, or to the to the to the grandfather or something that is just above and, and higher than them. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that federalism is not just division of power, but it's also cooperation. So for all the things that you divide and separate and hand out to the little cantons, um, there is always a domain where uh, the national level is in charge, but includes the cantons in its decision making. So we talked about the two chambers of parliament. Um, there is a whole half of the parliament, so the Council of States. Um, each canton gets two seats, no matter their population size, no matter their language, no matter their historical origins. So also when the canton of Jura was created in 1979, out of the fringes of canton of Bern, it was accepted as a full canton and given two full seats in the Council of States. So you have the equality principle that plays a role, but you also have the co-determination. So cantonal, nowadays it's it's the, the members of the Council of States are, are elected by the people. So it's not the cantonal governments that sit in the second chamber as in Germany, um, but it's at least the cantonal or at least people there perceive themselves as defending also their cantonal interests. So you always have kind of a second opinion at the national level. You don't just have the national outlook the people, the people's chamber, the national council that is elected using proportionality to give a better sense of the variety of preferences that exist in society and Swiss society. But you also have the, the Senate, the Council of, of, of States, to provide the other perspective, the territorial perspective, which oftentimes goes in the same way, but sometimes also has a radically different view because they are tasked, at least that's the idea, to defend federalism in the sense of defending um, the division of powers between the national and the, and the cantonal level, but also between the cantons. So the cantonal borders between the cantons, they also play a great deal for federalism. And they are also jealously guarded. We haven't had a single case of uh, serious entertaining, seriously entertaining cantonal mergers. There were two votations, uh, or three in total for two cases, and both failed uh, clamorously. Nobody wants to merge his canton or her canton away with another canton. Yeah, exactly. And this this territorial aspect of federalism is is really important, and I think also uh, helped the people to kind of balance to give up power to the central or to the canton and the central government, but also keep some aspects and and the possibility to shape institutions at the local and the cantonal level in their own way. So that was important uh, for religious ma minorities, but also for, for all the cantons that have different cultures, different uh, traditions, different um, dialects, etc. So that balance between giving up power to the central state while retaining 
uh, quite a lot of decision power at the at the regional or local level that was was important and not only in terms of uh, political power but also in terms of um, financial like tax uh, matters so uh, only a, a minor share of taxes are actually paid to the central government and the, the bigger part of the taxes you pay are actually staying within um, the cantonal boundaries and help shape um, public goods at, at the local level. So maybe we can also say that um, the federalism in Switzerland is, is really quite strong also at the, at the, at the very local uh, level. There are two other elements of Swiss federalism. One is the intercantonal cooperation and the other the fiscal equivalence mechanism. The intercantonal cooperation is essentially agreements between two cantons to jointly provide public goods or work together in a, in a certain area. For example, uh, in universities, that are usually located in, in urban areas, in urban cantons. They receive contributions by cantons around, which are more rural, but are still benefiting from the knowledge hub that a, a, a city or a university's um, canton generates. So, for example, between the two cantons, Basel City and Basel Landschaft, the, the rural areas of Basel, there are over a hundred agreements uh, horiz in horizontal cooperation. The other element is the fiscal equalization mechanism, which is essentially a transfer from richer cantons to uh, poorer cantons. So this is also a, an element that tries to balance um, wealth or tries to balance resources between uh, cantons. So maybe you can um, comment on these two elements as well to get like a f more full, full picture of the f uh, federalism in Switzerland. Yeah, it's absolutely important to not forget the horizontal dimension of federalism. So I take the, the intercantonal cooperation first. I mean, we had a, a colleague of mine did his PhD on, on that and just the, just the task of finding out how many contracts exist between the different cantons and are currently in force took him a couple of months because there is no central database of all these contracts because every canton autonomously decides if they want to do a contract with who on what. And uh, sometimes they archive them better or, or worse. Sometimes these contracts are very old and, and uh, he actually unearthed a couple of uh, contracts and informed some of the cantons that they were a member of that contract, although the contract was like 100 years old, but it had never been resigned, so it was still technically... I mean, some of these things are minor minor issues like agreement on where exactly the border between two cantons goes if there is a river and the river changes. So we're not talking high politics. But some of those things are actually important. For example, there is a, a major treaty uh, on harmonize, harmonizing the education system, because education, primary education, is still a cantonal domain. But to avoid a situation where if a family moves from one canton to another, they have to completely change the textbooks and are completely lost because the system is so different, cantons more or less voluntarily, under pressure from the federal level and from some of the parties, um, agreed to at least harmonize uh, their, their curricula and agreed and on, on common uh, structure for, for what kids oh. should learn in, in the primary school. Um, but this is just an illustration of, of, the, of the breadth of, of, the, of the number and type of treaties that are in force. Uh, the beauty of the treaties is that they're extremely flexible. So as a canton, you can join and you can, you can leave. There is no federal law that mandates you to join or leave. So it's up to you. It's up to the cantonal government, parliament, citizenry, to decide on whether to stay or leave or modify a treaty. But the flexibility is at the same time rather unflexible because once you're part of a treaty with five, six, ten other cantons and you want to leave or you want to modify and the others don't want to modify, there's not much you can do. Then you have to either leave uh, 
It's like an international treaty. You depend on others. And the irony is that these treaties were, or the, the idea of the treaties is to safeguard cantonal autonomy, to avoid that the federal level takes over. But the treaties themselves infringe on the cantonal autonomy. It's all a question of how many treaties you sign with how many other players, like the international level again. We want to safeguard Swiss sovereignty, so we sign up to counterterrorism or climate change treaties. But at the same time, we agree to abide by certain rules that limit our freedom to make decisions. But at least it's for our own good. So that's for the interna- intercantonal cooperation. <clears throat> um, related to that, we have the fiscal equalization system that is in a way very complex because there are three different tracks and one is provisional and then a fourth one was added to change the system a couple of years ago. But at heart, it is very simple. At heart, the system takes money from the rich cantons and gives it to the poor cantons. And on top of that, the federal level foots the bill to uh, 60%. So it's the confederation, the national level, and seven or six richer cantons, it depends on on which year we look at, that transfer some money to the 17 or 18 or 19 poorer cantons by some commonly agreed standard. Um, And they do that. Why? Why would they do that? They do that in a way out of solidarity because it's Switzerland. We're all in the same boat. Um, But they also do that in a way out of necessity to keep up their own autonomy because there was some pressure you mentioned the the tax system that is very much decentralized. Uh, decentralized is a nice word. We can also say it's heavily biased that uh, richer cantons can afford to have lower taxes um, that attracts even more richer people that come there. Um, so the, the land prices and the, the houses, the cost of living goes up. So people who can't afford poor people are driven out and more richer people come. So it's like a a, a virtuous spiral for those who were there first. They become richer and richer. And where do these people go? They go to the poorer cantons where land prices are lower, but tax is higher. So the poor get poorer and the richer get richer. Thanks to federalism and the tax competition. So the pressure built up to kind of limit uh, the extent of that system, or at least to provide for like a common uh, benchmark below which no canton should fall. So it was agreed that in a long process, it was agreed that 85% of the national mean should be what every canton has uh, in its own pockets. So the richer cantons pay also, in a way, it's like uh, back in the old days that led to the Reformation, when you can just buy your freedom. You can buy your tax freedom by paying some money into the fiscal equalization system to satisfy those poor cantons to satisfy the left-wing parties um, and that they stop pressuring for a centralization of the tax system. So in a way, it's the, it's the downside of federalism that you have inequality, you have huge inequalities, depending on whether you live in Canton of Jura or Canton of Zug. As a family with two kids, you pay either 2,000 francs in cantonal taxes or 8,000 francs in cantonal taxes every year. It's four times as much in, in, in the, the two uh, in the, the bracket, the range is so high. But at the same time, it again shows the beauty because there is a problem and there was a process and it led to a compromise. So the money is shared, like the power is shared. Not all the money is shared. The richer cantons still get richer, but not so fast as they did under the old system. And the poorer cantons, they get a little less poor, but they are still poor Uh, although they receive money that helps them unconditionally. They can use the money for whatever purposes they want to use it for. Mm, Cool. Thanks a lot for that compliment to the other institution, which is uh, less talked about, I'd say, but also this establishment of these quite complex uh, equalization mechanisms and also the cooperation between the cantons is, is only possible, I think, due to this kind of power sharing consensus type of, uh, of institution that allows for a very fine-tuned um, solution to be found by, by all parties involved. And it also, I think, it, you know, it took time. It, those, those institutions have to be developed, adjusted, and so on, until a, a solution is found that really satisfies you know, more or less everyone. Um, but also this, the discussion is always, uh, 
on ongoing. So let's wrap up the discussion here um, because I think we have given a, a good overview of the various uh, aspects of, of Swiss um, consensus democracy and how a country that was initially um, quite divided with um, religious groups being in, in conflict, but also of the four languages and the various different cultures that were integrated into that um, type of, of democracy and was a long, long process actually of, of finding solutions. Now, just at the end, I'd like still to um, ask you a few questions, a couple of questions that uh, I, I think is interesting for listeners to hear. The first one would be, um, what if you could change an institution, um, just top down, essentially, if you could change one, what, what institution would you change? I think if I could, I would make parliament more professional because for as much as I believe in direct democracy, and I told you in the beginning, my very first experience was a very direct way of experiencing democracy, citizens directly meeting and deciding on, on political questions. Um, as much as I believe in direct democracy, I also believe in, in, in the power sharing idea of we need a countervailing force. We need a, an, we need a place with elected officials that have the time and the skills and also the motivation, inspiration to really think about questions thoroughly and uh, listening to different sides and, and debating with each other taking into consideration different points of view, associations, cantons, international studies, us scientists, and that institution can only be parliament. So ironically, we need a strong parliament, or I think we need a stronger parliament than we have now to make overall democracy work better. I, I totally agree in the sense that parliament is such an important institution. And a lot of there are actually a lot of calls for in other countries for you know direct democracy or um, citizens assemblies kind of on a random mechanism basis etc. There's lots of discussion out there about these institutions, but in the end, it is a strong parliament, a strong legislative body that creates you know solutions that kind of satisfy the, all the different needs. And, and that is not really possible in, in a direct democratic sense because that process is, is, is very involving. Then the final question is, if, do you have any books that you, that you could recommend uh, regarding Swiss democracy or, or more in general? Um, there is the book by Jonathan Steinberg. It's aptly entitled, Why Switzerland? And uh, if, you, if you open it, you see immediately that it's a play on words. So why should you know about Switzerland? It's an interesting country, as we just discussed. It's peculiar. It's different from others. It's in a way even archaic, exotic. But the other question he asks also is, why is there still a Switzerland? How come it survived for so long and even became, in a way, a model and thrived to provide inspiration for other contexts in terms of federalism, in terms of direct democracy, in terms of power sharing? So why Switzerland? Um, summarizes not just the book, but also uh, some of the questions that we in political science asks, ask ourselves a lot these days. Cool. Thanks for sharing that recommendation. Okay, let's, let's end here. Um, thank you very much, Jean Müller, for being a guest, a guest on, on my podcast. And uh, let's see, we might uh, be able to do a, an update at some, some later stage. Thank you for having me. 